Let us continue to praise our Lord and remember the work he has done with a song we have not done for a number of years, and it's called We Will Remember. We will remember, we will remember, we will remember the works of your hands. We will stop and give you praise.
Yep, for our congregational prayer. Hi, my name's Keith. I'm one of the elders here. If you're new this morning, we'd like to welcome you here. Before we go to congregational prayer, we need to have the whole family in our prayers. I heard uh, a few days ago that High had passed away in hospital a few days ago. 
So we need to remember uh, that family as still uh, as well. She was very, very close to, to Ho or to Hai. As we go to prayer, I'd like to use uh, Psalm 111 to guide our thoughts this morning. Let's pray. Father, as we come together as a congregation of Eastwood, we give you thanks with our whole heart. And we praise you, Lord. We thank you for your word that you have given us, that we might know Christ and know what he has done for us, Lord. The great exchange where he took upon our sin and we took upon his righteousness, that we might stand before you, Lord. Father, we, we thank you for your word that we can remember and know of things that happened in the past. Uh, we think of Moses, Lord. We think of the, the people coming out of your people coming out of Egypt, how they were a weak people, but you were gracious, that you were merciful to them, and that you led them out. Father, we thank you for your word where we read how you, f- you provide for those who fear you, who follow you, how you remember your covenants that you make with us forever. And Father, we thank you how you've shown us through your word the, the power of your works, how we have an inheritance in heaven because of Christ. Father, you are faithful and you are just, you are trustworthy. And uh, we thank you. We thank you for the redemption that you send to your people, that you, how you've been faithful in the past and how you're faithful now, how, how you're faithful to us because of Christ, what Christ has done for us and how holy and awesome are you. And we, we pray, Father, that your word would be revered in this nation and uh, that your praises would come to you forevermore. And Father, as we think about our church family, we we pray for Pastor Dave. We pray that you would give him some uh, refreshment as he has a bit of time off. And uh, Father, we pray for our lead pastor who we we don't know yet. We pray that you'd be working in his life, preparing him. And we just look to you, Father, and pray to you now for for leadership, that you would bring us uh, the right man who would be a good example to us, that would pastor us, that would preach your word uh, in this city faithfully. Father, we pray for those who are sick in, uh, in our family as well. You know them, Father. We think especially of uh, Cindy Glenn going through treatments now. We thank you that she's doing uh, okay, although tired, Father, and we pray that you would be uh, her strength in these times, that uh, she would be resting on you, resting on your word, Lord, and that you'd be close to her. Father, we pray for our, our ministries, um, a few of them down right now, but we think of uh, the summer interns. And Father, we just we pray for uh, their work across the road, that your word would go forth, that it would be effective in the lives there. We pray for uh, it to be sown there, that we'd be an example to the children there. And Father, we, just, we pray for salvation, that your word would save people, that you would be Please to save uh, families, children, Lord, through that ministry. We pray that you would bless it, that you would keep uh, everyone safe and uh, give the, the students uh, leading it wisdom day to day. Father, we, we also pray for the prayer meeting that's going on uh, weekly. We, we thank you for it. We pray that you'd continue to, to hear us as we call out to you, that you would bless that ministry. And Lord, we, we pray for the, the summer Bible study uh, that uh, we're attempting with mom, mom, moms and munchkins. And uh, Father, that, just that you bless that. Bless your word, Lord. And Father, we pray this morning that you would be pleased with our worship as we've come to you in prayer and song. And, uh, and now, uh, through the preaching of your word, Father, help us to be attentive to it. And we, we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Pastor Kevin, would you come bring us the word now? And uh, good to be with you all, and uh, to see a few familiar faces, and um, that's just uh, very special. And uh, I just getting reacquainted after many years with an old friend. And do you know what that old friend is? It's right here. 
I played this thing for years, and when I walked in and saw it, it lit up. It lit up. It lit up. And I lit up too. So, uh, anyway, it's great to be here, and uh, thanks to Pastor Dave and, and Carol. We've known them for a lot of years, and uh, so it's good to be able to help him out a little bit here uh, this, this uh, day as well. Uh, this morning, I want to cause uh, you to stop, perhaps, and think um, what it may be to have an encounter with Jesus. And I have a question. Have you met him in a real and tangible and palpable way? Not talking about going to church, not talking about religious duty, uh, less, let, not thinking about ceremony or something like that, but just thinking of a, a, a time when you had a, a confrontation with Jesus. Uh, it, it may have been when you became a believer in him. And he cleansed you from a sin, from, from sin and degradation. And you know what it feels like to be forgiven for God, to be free, to meet Jesus as your, as your healer and physician. And that, that may be the experience of some of you. He has touched your body physically or he, he's done something wonderful in you. It may be the comfort that he has provided in his embrace when you've gone through the loss of a loved one or to feel his presence with you when you're undergoing a time of struggle, whether you're going to make it through or, or not, you're leaning on him, trusting on him, and seeing him bring you through. As we read the Gospels, we read of all kinds of accounts that Jesus has had with people. He's, he's touched so many different lives, the young and the old, the rich and the poor, the religious and the irreligious, the good living and the immoral, uh, the Jews and the Gentiles. He touched all kinds of lives, and, and each one in a unique manner. And it's my prayer this morning that was, as we focus on some of these thoughts, that there may be a, a, a something pressing in your heart that you may meet Jesus in a very personal and, and real way in your life this morning. So I want us uh, to turn to Luke chapter 5, uh, verses 17 to 26. Luke chapter 5, 17 to 26. And this is a, a, a familiar passage of Scripture, and uh, I hope the Lord gives, it, gives us something fresh and new from this uh, scripture uh, to help us. Luke 5, 70 to 26. Uh, listen as I, I read, please. One day Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because the house lay before him was so full, when they could not find a way because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on a mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what was, they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home, praising God. Everyone was amazed, and they gave praise to God. And they were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. Let's pray. 
Dear Father, we gather this morning and realize that there may be people who are going through deep and difficult times. We are grateful that Jesus loves us and that he has the ability to reach out to us that we might have an encounter with the risen Christ who is among us in the person of the Holy Spirit. So minister to our deep needs as we open our hearts to you. May we be open to receive from you as only you can give. And it's in the name of Jesus we, we pray. Amen. Scripture says, it was one day. It was just a normal every day. It, Jesus doing what he does so often and so, so regularly. He was teaching. He was healing. He was helping. Throngs of people followed and listened, crowding in and trying to get close to Jesus. There was a curious statement made in verse 17. It says, and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal. I mean, didn't Jesus have the power to heal? Why, why does he say this? It's interesting. What do you mean the power was with him? Is Jesus not equipped with all power? Well, I believe in Scripture that we, we see something that, that Jesus chose not to use his innate power as God the Son, divesting himself and relying on the Holy Spirit. This would be the same as us. And if you let this sink in a little bit, Jesus came and chose, I believe, not to use his innate power as God the Son, but rather he, he uh, you chose to trust God the Father and the Holy Spirit. Listen to what it says in Acts 10 and verse 38. Talking about Jesus and how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and power. And how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil. Because God was with him. There's something here. You can, you can read right by this and not realize uh, how profound it is. Because we have the same Holy Spirit that empowered Jesus to do what he did. We have the same Holy Spirit that going into the book of Acts, uh, God empowered. Don't, don't, Jesus said, don't go uh, yet, not until you have received power from on high. And he would grant them the Holy Spirit that they would have what they needed to live and to do the ministry that he has it. So here, here he is. We're called to find strength in the Holy Spirit so that we can rely on him and do as Jesus did. I, I think it's fabulous. It was a good thing that Jesus was granted this power because a man was presented to him with a great need. Four men carried a friend hoping to see Jesus. Hoping for a miracle, their friend paralyzed. I mean, it, it, just saying that, it just, it just rolls off the tongue so glibly. We don't know how, what, or where that this man was in these circumstances. Was it from birth? Was it an accident? Was it a disease? We don't know the extent of his disability. But it brings us back to a heartbreaking situation. My wife Gerda and I were... A number, quite a number of years ago, sitting, watching TV after, uh, after uh, dinner, and we heard this deep, undulating sound getting louder and louder, and, and so we, we went out on our porch and looked, and, and here was a helicopter, and it was just going across the sky, and we thought nothing of it, and went back in and continued watching our program, and... Um, the next day, I got a call from my friend that his brother had been in an accident. He'd, he'd fallen out of a tree. He was cutting some limbs out of a tree for his uncle. And um, he fell and broke his neck. He couldn't do anything when they finally found him and they air, uh, air uh, helicoptered him to Sunnybrook Hospital. Um, 
I went down to see him, and it was the most pathetic sight. He was laying in a bed. He, he had a, a halo screwed into his skull to keep things uh, settled. And I looked at this pathetic sight of my friend, who was a, a strong outdoorsman and uh, just a wonderful guy. And he said to me, Kev, could you, could you just scratch my nose? Can you scratch my nose? This, this guy, he, he was a consummate outdoorsman. He could not scratch his nose. We, we don't know whether this man had more than just, uh, it was more than just a paraplegic, but my friend was a quadriplegic. And after a few months of therapy, he was going home to the family farm for the first time. I remember I went there to, to greet him, and the, uh, the paratransit vehicle opened up, and they put him out in his wheelchair, and he stood just looking in a sense of wonder at what was so common to him before. His dog, his hunting dog, wouldn't come near him for some reason, so, so they took a couple of potato chips and put it in his hand and squeezed the fingers together and seeing that the dog would jump up and get close to him. But the, the chip fell helplessly to the ground. My friend was helpless. He was jobless. He was in pain. He was restricted, living the kind of life that he'd been so familiar for him. His wife deserted him. Uh, they, he, she just took her stuff and left, never to see him. Um, his mother would become his, his uh, primary caregiver. I say this to underscore the words. We read things in Scripture sometimes, and we don't really Im realize the impact uh, that, it, that it says that. Here's a man who, who's being brought by his friends because they think, Jesus can do something. I'm, we're sure if we can get him to Jesus, he'll do something for him. And uh, they wanted an encounter for Jesus, with Jesus for their friend. I am so impressed with these friends. I don't know how far they had to come to see Jesus, but they were determined to get their friend to Jesus. Carrying this par paralyzed man on a makeshift stretcher, and uh, who knows how far away. How blessed this man is to have some people who really care. Uh, I want to ask you a question. Whom has God put in your life that you might bring them to Jesus? Who, who is, is God put in your path that you might do something for Jesus in remembering Him? Someone needs an encounter with Jesus, and, and, and I say, even in talking about this, maybe somebody's name comes up in your mind. Somebody who could be helped by Jesus. You know that 80 to 90 percent of people who come to faith in Jesus Christ uh, do, some, do so on the influence of a family member or a friend. It's, not, it's, it's that simple. Here were friends who were going to do something. Uh, last night we got a call from somebody who's, uh, who's been very special to us in our previous church. Um, I had finished preaching one day when three women stormed the platform. I just finished the benediction and they, uh, they moved immediately, came right up. I couldn't even get off the platform and uh, met them. And two of these women were from Los Angeles. And they, uh, they had, the one particular, had a burden for her friend who's in Markham, where our church was. And, um, and so they came up and they began to tell the story. Um, her, her, this, this woman, uh, he, she, she was, uh, had this friend who came. The friend didn't have enough money to make it. But she it was so impressed that Christ wanted her to see her friend that is like L.A. to the, the greater uh, Toronto area. And, uh, 
And so they, they came up and she said, you know, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't afford it, but I knew the Lord wanted me to do it, and I got extra work, and I got enough work that I could pay the airfare. Her sister said, well, if you're going, I'm going too. And, and she was so burdened that her friend would come to know Christ um, that she could not be deterred at all. And so they began to talk to me and tell me what the, sto- what the story was and why they were there, because they wanted their friend to come to know Christ. And um, they, we, we sat down, and we went to my office, and we had a discussion and just shared the gospel. And the Lord opened her heart and, and moved in a mighty way, and she confessed Jesus Christ as her Savior. And, and, and it was that there was a friend there was somebody who says, there's, there's somebody in need here, and, and to reach out. And, uh, and God may want to touch a person's life in a profound way. You know that when we do the will of God, there can be obstacles. And, and this, this woman said, I, I'm, I, I want to trust Christ. She did. Her husband said to her, uh, well, you can go to church, but the kids can't go. Three weeks later, she said, well, the kids can go. And then she said, but you can't be baptized. And then here he was, and she was baptized, and he's there with a bouquet of flowers. Um, and, and just to see God, because somebody said, God has laid a burden on my heart. And I, I just see these guys, and they're not going to quit until they get this friend to Jesus. Uh, obstacles often come. And uh, here are these guys. They're in, an, they're in a place where the, the, they're crowded beyond belief. They, they've got people at the door, outside the door, hanging from the windows, and, and they, they, nobody was going to let them in. And so they're, they can't even get close. I mean, the, the fire marshal would have shut the whole thing down as, as being too crowded exceeding the limit. But that didn't deter them. They came here, and they're not going to go away without uh, and, and be denied of this. Now, houses in those days uh, often would, you know, would be kind of a, uh, a square, rectangle kind of building, and they would build it with a set of stairs on the outside, because here is space when it's really hot and, and that kind of thing that you could have some extra space. So they see this set, of, uh, this set of stairs, and they determined that uh, they'll take him up the stairs, and then they start to disassemble the roof. I, uh, that would really tick me off. Because while they're in there, they, they have like beams in, and they've got sticks, and there'd be mud and things, that, and, and now stuff is falling in the floor. People are looking up, and here are these guys um, determined to... Let, to, to get this guy to Jesus. And uh, here he is now, let down. He's in front of Jesus, and, and uh, face to face. His heart is racing, I'm sure. There's this great sense of, repu- uh, of, of anticipation. And Jesus saw, he says, the faith of these friends. You know, sometimes people don't have faith, but it's the faith of those who are reaching out to them And Jesus speaks this most beautiful word, looking at this guy. He says, friend. (laughs) How how beautiful is that? Here's the Savior. He he knew the kind of things that Jesus was doing. And so he says, friend. Jesus calls him friend. And he says, your sins are forgiven. (laughs) I didn't come. You know, like, time out, Lord. (laughs) It, it, it doesn't work, you know, it needs something from you. And, and, and so, how was it what we came here for? We didn't come here for that. That's not really the problem we wanted to address. Imagine the profound disappointment. We've gone to all of this, and you want to see Jesus touch this man, to do something, and, and, and so he would regain his mobility. And uh, Jesus knows, though, something 
critical, that his physical problem is not his greatest problem. That, that what he sees as his greatest need is not what God sees as his greatest need. You see, our greatest need is our sin. How it's separated us from God. How we're under God's condemnation and his judgment. And we would be eternally separated from him. That's what's really important. And things are not right between us and our Creator. We need His forgiveness. We need His acceptance. And that's what's most lacking in us. It's interesting, Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 18, He said, if your hand or foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than have two hands and two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. He's saying there, there are things in life that are more important than the things that are maybe driving you. And so often people bring needs to people, uh, to Jesus in a time of crisis. They have no interest in him. And then cancer strikes. Or their marriage breaks up. Or there's a financial crisis. Or they have a, ch- a child who is addicted to drugs, illicit drugs. All of a sudden, you find yourself crying out to Jesus. Jesus, though, sometimes gets treated like a genie in the bottle. You know, th- I want this. You know, you, but you have a sin problem. But, but my problem was this. My, my marriage broke up, and I don't want my wife to leave, and I want you to put it back together. And, and, and Jesus gets treated in that way. What, what he can do for me. I had a a uh, parishioner uh, whom I was contacted by his family that he'd had a very severe heart attack. And uh, I went to see him, and he took my hand with both of his hands, and and he was so remorseful. He had had grown up in a a home where church was a, a regular thing, and he promised God, God, if you heal me, I'll turn my life around to you. And God did raise him up. And he did come out to church a little bit. But then he was missing with the gathering. I mean, he kind of had his thing, and he was grateful for that. But things seemed okay, and so he moves on. People can search for God in the pain of their life. This, is, this isn't wrong, because God often uses pain to open us up to understand what our needs really are. But God can sometimes get his attention with us uh, and uses that for, uh, to, to call us to come to him for forgiveness and grace. But secondly, sin is the source of all our problems. Ultimately, everything that happens bad is sourced in sin. It's sourced in the rebellion of our first parents who, who in Genesis 3 chose to disobey God and, and dishonor him. And, and for that, um, they would, God would put a curse on the whole world. And all the kind of things that we go through with disease and murder and all, all of the terrible things that happen are all sourced in our rebellion against God. And sometimes we, we perhaps think, well, uh, if you're sick, Maybe God, it's God punishing you, but that, well, that's not the case always. In John chapter 9, the disciples asked Jesus, they had a man who was born blind, they said, we don't get it. Who, who sinned that he, he's born blind? Was it, was it him or was it his parents? And Jesus said, no, you, you don't get that. It, it was neither them. It was so that God would be glorified and God healed that man. Look at Job, who lost everything, wealth and health and family, and yet he was a righteous man. There was nobody like him in terms of righteous. So it's not necessary that that God is punishing people in that way, but he can in 1 Corinthians 11, when there were problems with the, uh, the communion service. And Paul tells them that... Uh, 
these abuses at the communion table is called to cause some people to die and some people to be sick. So it's not that we uh, push that away. In John 5, Jesus warns another lame man to stop sinning or something worse may happen to him. The bottom line is that uh, at the heart of all things, it's wrong. We need God's forgiveness. Jesus graciously offers this man of forgiveness of sin. But a statement galled the religious leaders. See, they introduced them very sneakily right at the start of the te text. But the statement galled them. They were leaders who were in tenants. They were thinking about this guy of Jesus. They had come from all over uh, the towns of Galilee and from Jerusalem and from Judea. And now Jesus stands up and, and has the audacity to say, your sins are forgiven. Who, who does this guy think he is? That's what's going through their mind. Who does he think he is? God only is able to forgive sins. But they really don't have a clue who Jesus is. They, they, uh, he shows them that he knows even every thoughts they're, ha they're having. He says to them, I, I know what you're thinking. And, and he comes up with a, a, a proposition for him. Um, he says, what's easier, what's easier to do? Is it easier to say, your sins are forgiven? Or is it easier to say, get up and walk? Now, they're in a bit of a pickle here. How can they respond to that? Um, and he puts them in, in such a way that you can't know that that person is forgiven of their sins. A flashing light doesn't come up or anything like that. Uh, you can say, get, but you can't say get up and walk and buffalo somebody with that. It's a no-brainer to say your sins are forgiven as no proof. We need, we need proof that Jesus, the Son of Man, has the authority on earth to forgive sins. And so he turns to the paralyzed man. He says, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And he did. What's your comeback with that? And, and he says, in essence, if I have the authority to do this, I have the authority to, uh, to take you from your sin and have you forgiven. Can you imagine and fathom the authority that Jesus has? I mean, just, just look, look at that when you're reading through, through the Gospels and, and his authority, his authority. He has authority. I, I once did a study on it, and it was just mind-boggling, the authority that Jesus Christ has. And as I said, he had it in the power of the Spirit, just as you and I who have the Holy Spirit have that as well. The paralyzed man goes, I mean, there is a party uh, whooping it up for what God has done. He's forgiven a person. He has healed him. And it took the Son of God willingly to give up his own life, to die on a terrible cross, to pay the penalty that we could be forgiven. There was no way out. Only Jesus could do that. Jesus, God the Son, coming as uh, as a human being, coming as a person, as a perfect human being, who does, has done everything that God has asked. The people are in absolute awe. What an encounter with Jesus. Our lives are changed. But it took the Son of God to do it. And, and I, I want you to think as we, as we come to a close here, and you, the musicians feel free to, to come up at, at this time. But from this, we need to understand how great God is, how powerful He is, how He knows, how He heals, that Jesus does that. Did you come here and this morning and not recognize that this may be a day that there's an encounter that you have with 
God, with Christ, with Jesus. Maybe, maybe, you, maybe you haven't bowed your knee to him and invited him to be your Savior. And, and today, maybe something in you, there's a, a tugging on your heart. There's, there's a, something, a yearning. There's something that, that, that God is doing right now. And I would encourage you to open your heart to that. To have this encounter with him. You didn't know this was going to happen when you came out today. You're just here because you're, you're, you do it by habit. And if, if Christ is opening your heart, I want to encourage you. Talk to one of your leaders. To, don't go away that you don't receive what he has for you. We need a, an encounter, a face-to-face -face encounter. And uh, you may have some problems, and you don't know how you're going to get by the, the problems you've got, the, the uh, financial problems, the, the issues that are happening in your family. And, and you just come to him and say, Lord, I need you. I need you. I, I, I call upon the name of the Lord. I seek your face. And, and, and he knows your need. And he is so gracious. Friend, friend. Maybe you need an encounter with him in that way. Maybe as we talked, you thought, I know of somebody that needs Christ. We moved, um, we moved a, a year ago back to London. And, uh, you know, in the process of buying a home, it was a hot, hot market. And uh, we... we had several offers turned down, and, and that, was, oh, that was cool with us because we said, God, we, we want to be where you want us to be. We want to be a friend to somebody who needs a friend. And uh, wonderfully, God has opened up some relationships. Yesterday morning, we invited uh, a few of our neighbors to come over just for a, um, a bit of a, a breakfast. And... Uh, we just love these guys. We pray for them every day. And uh, it's interesting that the guy texted me back and he said, Hey, would you guys like to come to breakfast at our place in another week and a half before we go away? Of course, we'd love to do that. Is, is there somebody needy? And God has placed you as a friend to them. Well, my prayer is you'll act on that today. You'll make a, a phone call or you'll do, you'll do something. And uh, my prayer is that we would see God touch people's lives in profound and wonderful ways. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your son Jesus and all that he has done for us. Lord, we thank you for his compassion and reaching out in love. And I pray, Father, that as we have needs, we would come to you. Where else could we go who could meet our needs like you could? And so I pray for those who are having a struggle, that you would meet them in a very personal and real way this morning. For those who are, have, have people who have, diff have just tough needs in their life, and they need a friend who can take them to Jesus, who can take them to the source. I pray, Lord, that they would act on that, and we would see uh, your beauty, your glory, your compassion, and, and the wonder of your grace. And so we, we pray these things in the precious name of our Savior. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Kevin, for your teaching of God's Word. Today we have a new song for you that I think you will have heard before and enjoy. If you're not familiar with the song, just enjoy it and have a listen. The song is called Build My Life. And with what Pastor Kevin was talking 
And what we've been doing today is some of the words are worthy of every song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Could you imagine back when that paralytic, when Jesus was there and everything going on? Like, amazing, totally amazing. So if you'll stand with us and join us as we try this new song. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one we could ever say. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead.
Our final song we have not done for some time. God is a strong and mighty tower. He's a shelter. He has the power, as we have learned today. In through the book of Luke, please sing with us the song, Your Name. that that you will lead us and guide us that you God will be glorified that you would lead us to that person that you know you want to become a part of their life like you have done with so many of us father we thank you for all that you do we thank you for the blessings that you bestow upon us and Lord if there is somebody here that maybe is riding that fence that just they're itching that, that they're scared they don't know what they want to do bring them to us God let us help them discover you in your great name we pray and ask blessings we thank you and we pray this in your name Jesus Amen you may be dismissed. <laughs>